Hello, I'm Robert Ellsberg. I'm the publisher of Orbis Books. I'm very glad to be joined here today by one of our illustrious authors, uh, Thomas Groom, who is really one of the uh, most influential figures in the area of religious education at Boston College, where he is a professor of theology and, and, and religious education. He is also, for many years, the director of Boston College's PhD program in theology and education. And he has written many landmark uh, books, including Christian Religious Education, Educating for Life, and What Makes Us Catholic. And his new book is called What Makes Education Catholic. And you might, hearing that, think that there's a question mark at the end. Uh, uh, in fact, he's not, he, in, in fact, the book is an answer to the implied question, what is Catholic education? What makes education Catholic? Uh, uh, and it's, it's a lot more than just uh, teaching the catechism or uh, Christian doctrine or belief, basic beliefs. Uh, and I, I wonder if you could start by telling, since you've worked in this area for so long, what is the kind of process or journey that led up to this book? And why did you feel uh, it, it had a message for us today? Yes. Well, thank you, Robert. And I'm delighted to be chatting with you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> In some ways, I've been writing this book for about 40 years mm -hmm. since I was a little junior faculty person at Boston College. And in some ways, the uh, epidemic kept me home and gave me time to uh, put it on paper. So it's an ill wind that doesn't blow some good. And I've been thinking about it for that long. And um, uh, because Catholic education is a very significant enterprise in the world. And not only we all we think of it always in terms of the context of the United States, but throughout the world, you know, it's in over 200 different schools in over 200 different countries. Um, there's something like 55,000 Catholic schools throughout the world, educating something like 150 million students. So this is an enormous enterprise that the church sponsors and with tremendous significance, I think, for the life of the world. So I've been asking and wondering about, well, what makes, what is distinctive about Catholic education? And of course, for a long time, we just presumed an answer. The answer was in the hands of the vowed religious brothers, sisters, priests, and so on that taught in our schools. If you go back to the 1960s, it was something like 95% vowed religious and 5% laity. But now that we turn that around, it's now something like 98% laity and a little over 2% vowed religious. What will maintain the, the, the identity and the Catholic identity of these schools? And I'll tell a quick story. Years ago, I was about to start a summer course at Boston College. It was a very young faculty person at the time. And an older gentleman walked in. He was from Australia, it turned out. And he took a look at me and he says, oh, he says, I thought you'd be a lot older. <laughs> so I said, well, give me time, you know, give me time. He says, yeah, but I've read two of your books. What he was really saying was, how, how could, you know, I thought you'd be a lot older. And I said, well, that's good. It's called getting tenure at Boston College before you're, be, even when you don't have much to say. Uh -huh. And he said, well, he says, did you ever, were you ever a principal of a high school? I said, no, never. So he gave home. Oh. I went and sat in his seat. So obviously terribly disappointed that I was going to be teaching this class. I'd never been president or principal of a high Catholic high school. But the break time, he came up to me and he kind of apologized for his behavior. And he says, Tom, I think I finally set, figured out what I need to learn. And maybe this class can help me learn it. Because he says, I know how to be a principal. I know about budgets and faculty and curriculum and all this stuff. I've been doing it for years. But he says, I need you to help me to become a spiritual leader. Because mm, mm. he says, that's what my school really needs at this point in time. Mm, mm. And in other words, Catholic education is grounded in deep spiritual values. Uh, and they're universal values. Uh, they're not unique to Catholicism. They arise out of Catholic Christian faith. But in fact, they're universal values. Uh, compassion, dignity, equality, justice for all, inclusion, welcome, hospitality, care for the downtrodden. I mean, these values are universal. And while we hold them out of our faith in Jesus Christ and our Catholic tradition, et cetera, et cetera, any person of goodwill can embrace them mm -hmm. and can be enriched, deeply enriched by them 
if an educational system permeates these values, or if they permeate an educational system, it can do tremendous good in, in people's lives. And I suppose I became convinced of that, Robert, from many of my travels. I've done a fair bit of traveling over the years, not recently, of course, with the COVID, but like Pakistan, for example, there's over 500 Catholic schools in Pakistan. It's the premier school system of the country. And Benazir Bhutto always said that she learned her Muslim faith at Jesus and Mary Convent School in mm. Karachi. Mm. And these schools have been giving a great education to Muslim children. Mm. Over 90% of the student body of the Catholic schools of Pakistan are Muslim. 90% of the faculty are Muslim. Uh, and yet they're giving a good Catholic education. Uh, and if you go into Korea, it's the same. It's about 80%. The Catholic schools in Korea are booming. Uh, and about 80% of their student body and 80% of their faculty are not Catholic. And yet they're giving an education that is distinctly particular uh, from and distinctive from the one sponsored by the government. Same way in Hong Kong, one in every four students in Hong Kong is in a Catholic school. 90% of them are not Catholic, 90% of the faculty are not Catholic. And you can go into Australia, New Zealand and Canada, especially where, where Catholic schools have states funding of some kind or other, government sponsorship. They are booming. But are they Catholic? And how will we maintain the Catholicity of them? And how will we train people and form people in the deep values that are to permeate a Catholic uh, school curriculum? Because without that, we'll be, we'll be making false promises. We'll be saying they're Catholic when they're not. And I'm very confident that it is possible uh, to for lay people of whatever background. Now, I think every Catholic school needs a cadre mm -hmm. of Catholic leaders that know the, the spirituality of it, that know the faith that grounds it, the values it's to represent, and then how to implement that throughout a whole curriculum. And I think if we can get that kind of a trained cadre of leadership people into our Catholic schools, then I think we have a tremendous contribution to make to, the, to this postmodern world. That it's a world that was never more in need of a value-based uh, education, uh, of an education that is done from faith and for faith, that, that lends people a sense of a transcendent horizon to life that they can live into and, and, and indeed be empowered by. So to me, it's, a, it's, it's an enterprise. I know we've been at it for about 2,000 years. Um, and in many ways, it goes back to those old schools in Corinth and Antioch and Rome and Jerusalem at the third and fourth century. So we've been doing it for about 1,600, 1,700 1700 years. And there's a lot to be learned from that, from that background and how it was done and the Catholic intellectual tradition that grounded it. But as I say at the beginning of the book, in many ways, the best grounding of Catholic education, the primary grounding of Catholic education is to be Jesus, mm -hmm. Christ. And people are often surprised when I say that. They think I'm going to say Thomas Aquinas or Augustine or somebody. But in, in many ways, that's where we have to begin. We have to reground the whole enterprise in, in this carpenter from Nazareth who walked the roads of Galilee and who was indeed the Christ of faith, the Son of God, and whose death and resurrection released this abundance of God's grace into human history that we now can live into and live by and be empowered by and so on. So it's a tremendously positive understanding of life and the human person and the values that can sustain us and uh, allowing those values to permeate the curriculum and the educational enterprise of a good school, I think is a great gift to the present world. And uh, I think we, we, we can do it, uh, but it does take intentionality. You, you, you refer, I, I was interested that you, you began by a long uh, discussion of, of Jesus and not just doctrines about Jesus, but, but Jesus to, as, a, as a model of, of, of teaching and, of pedagogy. And, and a kind of pedagogy, pedagogy as well. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what are some, what do we learn from Jesus about teaching? It's just extraordinary because it's the most frequent description of him. He's described as teaching 150 times, as explicitly teaching. But of course, everything about his life taught. So he, you know, the only miracle reported six times, the only two miracles reported six times in the scriptures are the miracle of the resurrection and the miracle of the loaves and fishes. Mm -hmm. So 
feeding hungry people must have been a central aspect of his public ministry to get recorded or reported six times, uh, four times, all in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then twice in Matthew, twice in Luke, uh, twice in Mark. Um, it must have been a deep failure so that by his very life going around feeding people, uh, curing people, including people, calling the marginalized to the table. Uh, this morning's gospel reading in the common lectionary, it was Mark chapter one, chapter two, very early in his public ministry, they begin to complain about him because of the people he was eating with. He was eating with tax collectors and sinners, welcoming to the table, which in the world of the time was an extraordinary symbol of, of hospitality, of inclusion, of affirmation, much more than it means in our time. So everything about him taught in one way or another. And then you can begin to discern a certain consistent pedagogy. Now, now the, 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 I know the difficulty of, of the historical Jesus, and I don't know what quest we're in now. I think it's seventh or eighth. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, but I follow Pagola, Jose Pagola, that we can at least approximate the historical Jesus, and especially how he taught. And in, in some ways, while we can debate, did he ever really say, I came not to bring peace, but the sword? Probably not. So that we can debate the ipsissima verba, the, the, what are the very words of Jesus? But his pedagogy is clear as a bell. And you see it in the synoptics, of course, he always, almost invariably begins with engaging people's everyday lives. The reign of God is like, you know, fisher people sorting fish. The reign of God is like a woman baking bread. The reign of God is like a, a sore who went out to sow some seed. I bet with any one of those analogies or metaphors or parables, he was engaging people's lives in the same way in John's gospel with the analogies and metaphors of the, you know, the light of the world and the life of the, the God as the good shepherd and all the imagery. But he was, he was turning people toward the what Paulo Freire, my great mentor in life uh, as a pedagog for pedagogy, he was turning people to their own reality, dad, to their own reality and getting them to stop and look. And, and uh, you know, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Everybody knew what he was talking about. Uh, that's because it was a dangerous road. The fellowship went down by himself. There were all kinds of reflections going on, engaging people's ordinary everyday lives, but then often turning their life upside down. And getting them to see life in a whole new way so the the samaritan becomes the neighbor and they the prodigal gets welcomed home and lazarus goes home to god and the rich man to hades totally contrary to the worldview that people would have had so he got them to do what freire would call critical reflection very often and consciousness raising reflection and in the midst of that he indeed proclaimed his gospel uh, his gospel of the reign of God. Again, it's reflected in today's gospel reading that this, this pro preaching of this reign of God, God's desire, God's intention, God's hopes for all of creation and for all people. And again, the gospel, Matthew, Mark's gospel chapter one says, and he did it with authority. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't a wishy-washy, how do you feel today? Uh, what do you think yourself type of person? He engaged their lives, got them reflecting on it, brought those lives to the faith, tradition to the, the gospel he was preaching, but then invited them to take it back into their lives, to see for themselves. And, and blessed are those who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And obviously he meant more than physical sight or hearing, uh, but he wanted them to take it back into their life as a living faith. So I, I summarized it all. And I've been writing about this for years, Robert. Um, but it, in many ways, it can be boiled down when people ask me, Tom, what's the pedagogy you're talking about? And especially for religious education. Mm -hmm. I said, it's very simple. It's asking people to take their lives and bring it to their faith, and then to take their faith and bring it to their lives. Mm -hmm. It's life to faith to life. Mm -hmm. And I was lecturing one night in Lithuania about shared Christian praxis, which is the technical term I give for that pedagogy. And my translator, Sister Barute, came up to me afterwards and said, Tom, what do you really mean by this? The, the people can't understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it was in second language, et cetera. I said, it's very simple. I said, it's bringing life to faith, bringing faith to life. She said, great, but don't I tell them that? So she did, and they got it. And I've been using that simple summary of it in many ways ever since. But you see that pedagogy writ large in the in the in the praxis the teaching praxis of the historical jesus and it's it's absolutely amazing it's the risen christ that's at work in luke 24 uh the road to emmaus 
where he begins with their own lives. What's, you know, what's the stories? You know, they say all the things that happened in Jerusalem. He says, what things? Now, nobody knew better than he what went on in Jerusalem. Uh, and yet he wants them to tell him their, their shattered story and their shattered vision that we were hoping. He was the one who would set Israel free. And, and, but he gets it all out on the table. And only when he has got them to name and reflect upon their own realidad, as my friend Freire would say, only then does he begin to instruct them. Mm -hmm. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interprets every passage of scripture that referred to himself. The Messiah had to suffer to enter into his glory, but he still doesn't tell them what to see. Mm -hmm. But he does sit and break the bread. He took it, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it. Mm -hmm. And with that, their eyes were opened. It was the Eucharist, mm -hmm. but it was the real presence, but it was also the presence of the risen Christ. It was, they came to see for themselves. And the amazing thing about that passage, he never tells them what to see. He waits and waits for them to see for themselves. And my students often say to me, and then he disappeared from their sight. And my <laughs> students have often asked me, Professor, why did he disappear? I said, well, his work was done. <laughs> They'd come to recognize him. And they were on their way back to Jerusalem to re-engage their faith in a community of faith. But that type of pedagogy uh, is what I think can permeate religious education, but Catholic education in general. Uh, and I try to say that in the, in the book uh, a little more coherently than I'm saying it here. Well, in, in terms of that, we don't, we don't have too much more time, that, that idea of bringing faith to life. Uh, toward uh, the end of the book, you, you address this idea of, of Catholic education as forming uh, faith-filled uh, citizens or, or citizens for public life. I'm not yes. sure how you put it. For a public faith, <clears throat> for a faith that we have to bring into the marketplace. Mm -hmm and have to champion the cause of compassion uh, for those in need, and then justice <clears throat> for all the structures and mores of our culture and our context. Um, it, I mean, our faith, I often say to my students, if Jesus had said to us, um, love God by loving yourself, we wouldn't have to have a public faith. We wouldn't have to have a, the, the, there would be no politics, really. It would all be private and personal. But he said, love God by loving your neighbor as yourself and with neighbor, even including enemies. Mm. And to bring that kind of faith into the public realm demands commitment to justice, to compassion, to fullness of life for all. How can you love the neighbor? How can you love God by loving the neighbor as you love yourself? I we often forget the third leg of that great commandment to love ourselves. But how can we love the neighbor as we love ourselves and thus love God? and uh, ignore their needs, uh, injustices that they're, that, they're, that they're suffering, exclusions. Mm -hmm. uh, I say it very clearly in the book, you know, if, if, uh, um, uh, if, if young people leave our schools and they're sexist or racist uh, or homophobic or, or just think that uh, climbing the ladder, uh, it's, uh, the race to the top is all that matters, if, they, if that's how they leave our schools, we have not given them a Catholic education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that, that, you know, your book is primarily addressed to Catholic educators, but I think it also is, is a kind of, uh, just a very inspiring uh, presentation of, of Catholic faith as a kind of lens for looking at the world. Uh, yeah. life approaching life in a, in a, in a certain way uh, and so uh, it's just so rich and and so many things one could take from this what do you think your your book or this teaching on on, on catholic education has to say to the polarization both within our society and in the church uh, in america today oh my goodness robert i i honestly have to say i i don't know uh with any great clarity. Um, I suppose my conviction is that if we can bring back people back to the deep values uh, that are not unique, by the way, to Catholicism, it's just we have our rationale for holding them. And of course, they're mirrored and modeled for us by the historical Jesus, et cetera, et cetera, and then appropriated and understood down through the last 2000 years. 
Um, so this is a tradition that's tried and true and, and certainly has been tested over time. Uh, and I think it, it has great wisdom to bring to the table of the discourse in our time or the lack of discourse in our time. Um, I don't know how we're going to move beyond the kind of impasses that we seem to be moving into as a country. Uh, it's very, very worrisome. Um, but certainly a system of education, this, I, I suppose this is going to sound very unfair, but you see the public, so public school education in the United States is almost totally devoid of any kind of moral formation, of any kind of ethic. Even the, because we're afraid that we'll impose ethics upon them. So we're totally into the STEM courses, the, the science, the technology, the engineering and the math. We're great at it, but they don't touch values or morals or ethics at all. In fact, even the civics curriculum, there used to be a token civics curriculum in most American public high schools. It's nearly all gone. Very, very few schools are offering a civics course anymore, trying to pre prepare good citizens. It's all about the race to the top. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and getting ahead and so on. There's almost no values. And in, now there's, I'm being sweeping and on a fair probably. And some of this is the result of the diminishment of, what, of epistemology. You know, what does it mean to know? And reducing that to technical rationality, which happened, you know, especially with the enlightenment and the post enlightenment and so on. Uh, we left a lot behind. Uh, in the old traditions of Aristotle and Plato about what it means to know. For to them, it was always very holistic and formative and ethically and virtue producing and so on. We've none of that left anymore in our public education. So in some ways, the only, the only form of education, now not the only one, but the major one alternative to that. There's very good Quaker schools, there's very good Methodist and Episcopalian schools, and they, of course, share very similar values to Catholic education. But I would say that faith-based education is one of the best hopes we have for the future of the world and for the future of our country. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Tom. You may never have been a high school uh, principal, but I think people can tell that you're an extraordinary teacher. Uh, and this book has much to uh, teach us and to inspire us with. And uh, once again, What Makes Education Catholic by Thomas Kroon. Thank you, Thank Robert. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you.